Hey, uh, how are ya? How do you like the new hairdo? Thought I'd try out something different. Hopefully that's coming through loud and clear. Um, I didn't have the microphone on to begin with because I didn't want you hearing me messing about in the 10 minute lead up. Whew. Okay, it is working. I can hear it coming through on my phone. Okay, we got with us here today. Hope you enjoyed that bit of a comic relief entrance. Jeez, we've got heaps with us today. Big news, we had a, a world record, well not a world record, a channel record. We had a peak audience of 54 people watching all at once yesterday, so that's absolutely incredible. When I started this about 10 days ago, I think we had five, five viewers and we've grown up to 54 already. So share this with your friends, tell your camera clubs, Let's see if we can't get it up to 100, and who knows where it goes from there. You know, who knows how long we'll be doing this for, but I plan on keeping on doing this for the foreseeable future, you know, until, I guess, until life goes back to normal, or, you know, who knows what. I've got a whole list of things that I want to get through. Um, huge news as well, I managed to get through an entire week of doing this for one hour in the morning. And next week, maybe Monday, maybe Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, and it will probably be a two-part episode, I'm going to look at how we can spend our time productively and try and sow the seeds, if you like, for future income streams. So build some future income streams with the spare time that we may now have, okay? So using that productively to create a stronger business or even a new mini business and create some small income streams potentially. All right, so many names here. This is absolutely phenomenal. Who have we got? We've got Maribi, Gay, Darren, uh, Declan's here again, Katrina, Jill, Paul, Roger, Stephen, Anthony. I think I said Jill already. If I didn't, Jill, Keith. Alec, Sam, so many. Pamela again. Pamela, um, just to let you know, hopefully this is coming through loud and strong now. There is no sound for the first 10 minutes while we're kind of warming into this. Tim Matthews, big shout out to Tim. He runs the Easy Way Photography Instagram page. So jump over there and follow Easy Way Photography on Instagram. And if you tag Easy Way Photography on Instagram, Tim just might pick you up and feature you on our page, which would be pretty cool. Check out the photos there. Okay, Monica. Neville. Neville, you're always one of the first here. Good to have you again. Leslie as well. Brilliant. Hopefully coming through loud and clear. Um, I can't see how many viewers we're starting with. Doesn't really matter, but yeah, let you, if you're enjoying this, let your friends know. Um, a bit of fun anyway, isn't it? Oh, let me put that over there because that's where the good internet is apparently. Fingers crossed that that we get a fairly smooth stream. A couple of little bits of housekeeping. Remember down below if you're wishing to learn Photoshop, I have changed my most popular Photoshop course. My Essentials Complete Photoshop Workflow course is now pay what you like. So if you can afford a couple of dollars, then that would be much appreciated. But if you're doing it tough, then just put in zero and you can have the course as a gift. No, no dramas about that whatsoever. If you would like to support the channel and you're enjoying this, of course, you can share with your friends. But you can also do little things like just tick the like button, leave a comment down below. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode, then, of course, click the subscribe button and click get notifications. Keep in mind, next week we're going to do some really, really good stuff, including looking at how to make a little bit of income from photography with our spare time using some examples that I'm currently using, some real world examples, if you like. All right. So if that sounds good, you don't want to miss that, then absolutely hit the subscribe button and get those notifications coming. Okay. Today, what we are going to look at, excuse me, I'm just going to sit up like a, like a yoga. What's one of those yoga teachers? Oh, I like sitting cross-legged on my office chair for whatever reason. Um, it's comfortable. You wouldn't think so. What are we talking about? 
Okay, today we are going to look at one of my biggest inspirations in photography in the last four or five years. It is the genre of romantic landscape painters from back in the mid 1800s, mid, you know, or mid 1800s, 1850-ish. And my favorite romantic landscape painter from that period is a gentleman by the name of Albert Bierstadt. I believe you can go and look him up. Go and Google Albert Bierstadt. Um, I'll type it down here so you can see how it's spelled. Oh, well, that's big text. Hang on. I believe. And this is, of course, one of Albert's. Uh, I'm a horrible speller. I think it's spelt like that. If you type that in, it will pop up anyway because Google will know what you're trying to say. It might be E-I or I-E. I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so look up that. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how bad I am at spelling, and I might have said this before, did I? But... Um, Often when I'm spelling and there's spell check on a Word document, it puts that little red squiggle under a word that I'm trying to spell. And of course, that means I got the word wrong. And I right click on the little red squiggle so that I can correct it. And it doesn't even know what the word is. That's how bad I am at spelling most of the time. Pretty damn ordinary. All right. Albert Bierstadt, incredible inspiration to a lot of landscape photographers. A lot of landscape photographers eventually find the work of the romantic landscape painters and then draw a huge amount of inspiration from that particular period of painting. One thing that I find really, really interesting, you know the whole story about what are we allowed to do with our photography? Like how far are we allowed to push it? There's one sort of side of the coin that says, well, it's got to be it's got to represent reality. It's got to be, you know, straight out of camera or minimal processing and represent what the eye saw. And then there's the, the kind of the flip side of that coin where I kind of stand, which is no boundaries, do whatever you like, be as creative as you like. And essentially there are no rules. Well, interestingly, from a, the little bit of research that I've done back in the day when the romanticists started applying their trade and they were creating these incredible dramatic scenes that didn't necessarily rep represent exactly how the scene looked on the day. You know, they might have been standing in front of the landscape, but maybe the light and the clouds and the drama wasn't there. So they used the landscape as kind of a structure for the image and then, and then added all the light and the drama and the clouds and all those kinds of things to create a sense of what they were feeling or what the landscape felt like to them, I suppose, something like that, but not necessarily reality. And the interesting point that I wanted to say was, this is a couple of hundred years ago or so, and back in the day, apparently there was a huge uproar from, because back at that point, there was no photography as yet. It might have been just on the development phase, maybe, or just coming in, maybe 50 years later. And back in that time, the landscape painters, their job was mostly to capture reality. They were the story, I mean, the, the storytellers, if you like, but capturing reality, capturing the postcard, capturing the beautiful scene as it was, as it was there in the moment so that that could be shown via an exhibition to, you know, all the people in the city seeing these incredible landscapes out in the wilderness but then the romantics came in and they started infusing their photography with this all this drama and light and emotion and there was a huge uproar you can't do that that's not what landscape painting's about okay so that controversy because we hear that today isn't it you do something in photography you can't do that that's not what landscape photography is about okay now my point being that that argument has been going on for maybe nearly 200 years. So investing too much energy in that is probably probably a waste of energy, to be honest. I mean, my philosophy is that each one of us individually defines what photography is for ourselves, and we shouldn't really invest too much energy in trying to enforce that definition on anybody else. You know, if we have a little box that says our photography must look like reality, then trying to take someone like myself and force me into that little box is not going to work terribly well. So do what you love, 
you know, do it with passion and don't worry too much about what everyone else is doing or what everyone else is thinking, okay? Not really, not really our concern. All right, here's some of Albert Bierstadt's work and if you enjoy this work, go and take a look, go and Google his name, hit Google image search and I think you're going to love it. I absolutely do. So here's a gorgeous one here. I suppose the signature style is just spectacular light exploding from the artwork, big bold clouds and skies, which we're going to look at recreating today to some degree, um, and just lots of drama, that dark versus light element, you know, absolutely spectacular. Let's have a look at a couple more. Let's close these down because I've got a lot of stuff in Photoshop open and I don't want to have a freeze like yesterday and lose everything. Here we go. Here's another one. Just big skies, big clouds, big light, lots of drama, lots of light, lots of dark. Um, that play between light and shadow. Look at the way this cloud frames up that distant mountain. Absolutely spectacular. What I do want to point out is look at the way the clouds look like they're sitting over the top of the landscape. That's something we're going to be looking at today. The clouds sitting over the landscape, whereas when we capture our landscapes with a wide angle lens, which is what a lot of us do a lot of the time, it pushes the clouds back and they look like they're all the way back there on the horizon. Whereas when these romantic painters paint their big, heavy, dramatic clouds, it looks like they're sitting above the landscape more so than what our wide angle lenses can create. So we'll look at trying to replicate that. Close that. We keep coming back to that one, don't we? Here we go. This is just spectacular. Look at this one. Look at the light. I call them grandscapes. And this image in particular was one that inspired the next image, which is my own. And you'll see the, the significant drop off in quality probably between Albert's work and my own work, particularly as this is one of the most spectacular. So I'm following up, I'm on a hiding to nothing really, aren't I? Um, but just look at the light, the drama, the clouds. Once again, the clouds are really interacting with the scene. They're sitting over the scene. Just spectacular. Wouldn't we love or love to have one of those hanging on our wall at home? Absolutely. I'm not sure how. I'm sure they're millions of dollars these days for an original. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've never looked at the price. I don't think I could afford it. So I haven't bothered. I just enjoy it like this. Okay. Not this one. This image keeps popping up. But this is the one that was inspired, well, Albert Bierstadt and the romantic painters inspired this piece of work here. It's a grandscape of my own. It's made up of about 10, maybe 12 individual images. And I'll tell you what, maybe next week or in the week after, I might get those 10 or 12 images and I'll do a live mashup of putting this back together. Okay. We could do that. If you think that sounds like fun, let me know down below. Okay, does that sort of feel like there's sort of the, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't quite have quite the intensity of an Albert Bierstadt. I agree, he's one of the masters. I'm, I'm not trying, you know, to get to that level is something that I would, to have that control of light and drama and intensity is something that I would like to achieve in the future. I'm not there yet, but we're all on the pathway. We're all on that sort of continual growth journey, if you like, and just by playing and experimenting and trying to achieve something similar, we can keep improving and hopefully get there one day. What else have we got here? That's that one that keeps popping up. We have this one here. If you look through Albert Bierstadt's work, again through Google Image Search, you will see these huge crashing waves. Now, this interesting is really, really interesting on a couple of levels. Maybe one level, maybe two. It's interesting because of the way it's put together. This was this was taken just at my home beach here at Crescent Head, and it was one of the biggest storm swells that I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I grew up around the beach pretty much all my life. I was a surfer as a kid, um, as a teenager, 
So I've seen some big swells. I know what they look like. I know what they feel like. And I know what they sound like. So these swells, they were smashing into this headland, into this rock. And the thump of the wave that was hitting that rock, you could feel it in your chest like a firework. You know when, a, when the firework goes bop like that? And you can kind of feel the vibration, you know, inside your chest. Well, the waves were creating that kind of sound wave. And I could feel it. You could hear it. You could see it exploding. It was absolutely huge biggest swell I've ever seen. But when it came to capturing a photograph of this swell, I put on the wide angle lens like I normally would, and guess what? It pushed everything back because I couldn't get close enough to the wave. One of the key secrets to wide angle photography is get close to your subject. Fill your frame with your subject. That's what wide angle photography is designed to do, but I couldn't get close. I would have had to have stood on one of these little rocks here in the foreground. And that probably wouldn't have ended too well. So standing back, the waves look very, very small. Let me show you, actually. I've got the raw file underneath here. Okay. Oh, there's a few dust spots on there too, isn't there? Look at that. Do these look like big waves? There's signs that kind of hint that they're big. But in the grand scheme of things, the scale is very difficult to see. And it, it doesn't look that intimidating to me. It certainly doesn't feel like the most powerful big Wednesday swell that I've ever seen or whatever it might be, does it? Okay, but then if we go back to the finished product, now we're talking, now we've got some energy, now we've got some movement, now we've got some power, we've got some light, and we've got some drama. The way I did this was I captured the foreground with my wide angle lens. Or I think it was like a, a standard lens, maybe a 35 or a 50 millimeter lens. Grabbed that frame there, wasn't terribly impressed, but I didn't want to leave without trying out a couple of different things. So then I went and grabbed, I put on the 400mm lens, and I went and grabbed about 200 frames of different waves breaking and flicking and here, there, and everywhere like this. Oh. There we go. Look at that. Look at that beautiful wave. 400mm lens, zoomed in. What I also did, I had it on a tripod, roughly held on a tripod, still had the ball head fairly loose so I could move it around. And then I had the shutter speed set to about a third or a half of a second. So quite slow, which allowed all that whipping and spraying and movement to be captured within the frame, which really helps oh, the romantic feeling and the energy in the final finished product. Well, at least I feel it does. So, you know, this is a great example of where I was at a particular location. I wanted to capture a particular energy, a particular feeling, but the camera was incapable of capturing that feeling, that energy with one single shot, given the constraints I had on where I could stand safely. So, by using a couple of frames and Photoshop, we managed to To do. You can see there's a lot of layers, isn't there? We managed to produce something like this that has the power, the energy, the motion, and the light that I was going for. We might even have a play around with this image um, later on, you know, next week or the week after. I've got a long list of things to do. It's probably going to last me another three weeks. Then I might start floundering around for things to do. No, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be fine. Let me know if you have an idea of what we can do. I might do some interviews with other photographers. Um, we'll find things to keep us busy. All right, we can always look at images like this and how they're put together as well. Okay, all right. Don't save, that's a big file. Now we have this one here, and this is going to be the one that we're going to have a little bit of a play around with today because what I want to show you is how we can take Oh, there's a big dust spot right there. Never mind. Forget you saw that. How we can take a wide-angle foreground and place a zoom lens like a 200mm or a 400mm cloud and make it sit more so over the top of the scene, making a more intimidating, more foreboding, more dramatic photograph by that cloud and the perspective of that cloud being more interactive with the foreground rather than being pushed right out of the scene. 
Okay, it's one of my favorite techniques for adding drama to my images is combining zoomed in or long lens clouds with wide angle foregrounds. It just messes with the perspective on such a beautiful dramatic level that I think you're really going to love it. How's the stream going? Are we coming through loud and clear? Let me just check. Give me a yell if it's good. Let me have a squizzy. Someone says try higher quality under settings. No, in fact, we tried that and it gets worse because I don't have the internet speed to upload the higher quality settings. Um, unless that was in reference to someone that's got a blurry picture, in which case, yes, higher quality settings, but it depends on your internet. You might be best setting it to auto or a lower setting during the live stream so that it comes through fairly smoothly. Um, and then if you want to go back and see it in higher quality, wait for the replay to um, finish up and then you can watch it in 1080p or something like that. Seeing and hearing well. Wow, we've got so many comments this morning. How are we going? Have we set a new world record of beating 54? Um, <laughs> I'm a bit preoccupied with that, aren't I? All good. You're saying all good, all good. Bit of lag. Sorry about that, Andy. Maybe try Andy. Maybe try lowering the settings down a little bit and see if that helps. Um, maybe it's my end. Maybe it's maybe it's the internet at your end too. Terry Boyd joining us late. All good now, apparently. Anyway, seems like we're coming through relatively well, which is great. We're going to now work on an example of this image here. Basically, we've got that's the cloud. I've got another cloud there we might have a play with. I've got a base background sky. Okay, so often when I replace a sky, I'll replace it with not just one sky, two, three, or four skies with different pieces all coming from different sections. Um, and there's the raw file. Okay, so if we have a look at this image just quickly, Lots and lots of layers. And most of those layers are doing like one percenters. Just little tweak, little tweak, little tweak, little tweak, little tweak. Until um, I get the exact... I mean, for me, this one has a beautiful intensity of light and drama. It's, it's probably one of the most... The images that really captures that explosion of light more so than, than many others of my images, let's say. So this would be something that is... It's one of my more recent images, I suppose, that I put together. And, and you can see I'm starting to get a really good grasp, hopefully, of really getting that explosion of light and drama into those images. And hopefully I can help you in the next couple of months or, or whatnot to really elevate your photography to exactly where you want it to be. Let's have a look at the raw file here. Oh, not that one. It's much the same, but there it is there. Now... There's going to be a bunch of people probably in the audience today that say, well, that one's better. I like it better. There's more light. It's lighter. It's brighter. It's happier. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. There's nothing, there's nothing that says that this one isn't better. When I'm there, or actually, I just want to, let me just run through very, very quickly a little bit of my philosophy. I go about my images in generally two ways, maybe three ways. The first way and the more standard way is I let the landscape influence my own feeling. I try and feel the landscape and then I try and process that landscape based on the feeling that I absorbed whilst I was capturing that image. Okay. And then second, which is what we're going to do here, I might have an emotion deep inside that I just feel the need to project outward onto my photography. And in this case, you can see we've got a very bright, sunny you know, sunrise photograph, and we're going to turn it into a very dark, moody, where are we? A very dark, moody, foreboding, intimidating, gloomy type image. There is gloom, but there is also a tremendous amount of hope in this image for me because of that explosion of light coming through the horizon. So you have the, the battle between light and dark, which is a very romantic sentiment. Okay, and the third way, one, two, feel the landscape. No, that's really it. Two ways, I think. If I think of a third way, I'll let you know. One more on that. 
you might have heard of impressionism and expressionism. Okay, and that's essentially what I just explained there. Impressionism, to me, is essentially allowing the landscape to enter your soul, if you like, allowing it to speak to you, allowing yourself to feel the energy of that particular landscape, and then trying to project that energy that you felt back into your artwork to share with your audience and share with the world. That would be impressionism. That's what I guess that's what a lot of us are generally trying to do. But then you have expressionism which is kind of the flip side of that, where you take an emotion that you're feeling inside your soul, and regardless of what the landscape is saying to you, you express those feelings into your work and onto that canvas to share with your audience, okay? So I've got, I've got a few series of my work that rep represent both sides of that scale. Impressionism, feeling the landscape, and then trying to communicate that back to my audience, or expressionism, having a vision and, you know, capturing that photograph and then trying to express that inner emotion, that inner vision, the inner creative vision out to my audience. And that might not have anything to do with the actual reality whatsoever. Okay. Cool. I hope that makes sense. I've been banging on a bit this morning, haven't I? Let's do some practical stuff. Let's have some fun. So let's come over here. I've never live edited this photo. So it could be good. It could be a train wreck. Regardless, it should be entertaining. Train wrecks are always interesting to watch someone sort of, um, you know, struggling to get through and edit live on YouTube. Let's see what happens. What we're going to try and do, eh, we may not replicate the exact image that we have back over there. I might create a slightly uh, gloomier, darker style image. Or yeah, yeah, we might create the light. Let's, enough talking. Let's do it. All right, let's just zoom back here. I'm going to grab the crop tool. Um, now, this is not this is not really going to be like a, a follow along type tutorial. I will go through this pretty quickly, but what I'll do next week is I'll come back and I'll break this down into sections because if I was to slow this right down, it, we might be here for two hours and I wanna try and get through this in the next probably half an hour. Um, but what I'll do next week is I'll break these, this down into pieces and, and we'll come back next week and I'll show you how to replace a sky and I'll show you how to do all these other bits and pieces. A lot of the techniques I've already shown you throughout some of the previous videos. Um, but what we're going to do, I've just grabbed the crop tool. It's the easiest way to extend the canvas. Let's just bring that canvas out, give us some working room. Click OK. Oh, I'm out of out of chai tea. Okay, now what we're going to do is I'm going to grab this as a bit of a grey base sky layer. So I'm going to replace the sunset sky with this grey base layer. This is in fact a relatively wide angle overcast sky. I think it's about 25, 30 millimeter, quite wide. We'll use this as a base. Command or Control A, Command or Control C, Not that one, where are we? On the end, remember it's on the end. Command or Control V. Okay, let's hide that for now. Click on our background layer, layer zero it's now called. I'm going to grab the quick selection tool. And I'll do a tutorial on this in the upcoming weeks because a lot of people have trouble with it and I think it's like the most powerful tool, selection tool Photoshop has. It's just phenomenal. Um, but it does take a little bit of practice and it has some sort of subtleties and nuances that we need to sort of get around. Hopefully this image works okay. We just click and hold and drag that around the sky to get a rough selection like so. It'll probably make a fool of me live, Murphy's Law, hey? If I hold down the Option or the Alt button, I can reverse it to minus and try and pick up that horizon. Pretty good. We then click Select and Mask. And this uses a lot of Photoshop power, so fingers crossed that it doesn't crash. We grab the brush down, it's called the Refine Edge Brush. We make it really small, and then we run along the horizon here. And this is like 
It's kind of like shrink wrapping or heat wrapping plastic. It just really tightens up and sort of sucks in the mask all the way. Watch when we come around this tree. In fact, I'll zoom in. Zoom right in. Watch this. I hope. Yeah, can you see? Did you see what happened there? That went from very rough. Watch this. It's a very, very snug on that edge. You're gonna make a liar of me down the side? No, it's very good. There's a little bit there that's not working very well. But in general, this works really well. Beautiful. Click OK. What I like to do at this point is I just add a blank curves layer. I could use any layer really. I probably should use something else. But we'll use a blank curves layer. And what will happen is if I hold down Alt now, you can see it's got the mask, but it's actually grabbed that sky selection and attached it to that mask. Okay. And if I double click where it says curves one, I'm just going to call this sky mask. It can be somewhere where I can save and keep the mask. Of course, I could save the selection up in the select menu here. There's a save selection down there, but there's actually less steps involved in saving it on the desktop like this. Okay. Now what we're going to do is if I hold command or control down, command on a Mac, control on a PC, click on the mask, re-highlights that selection. I'll click on my sky layer above, add a mask. Now my sky layer above has that same accurate sky mask. There we go, look at that. Let's zoom in a little. Okay, now, the mask itself has some pretty hard edges, so we can, I want to actually go upwards more. So B for brush, I've got a white brush, opacity and flow at 100%. There we go there. And all I'm going to do, see I can, just painting with white to extend that mask up. Let's get a nice big, 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 big sky. Um, we could probably even go up a bit more like that. And then, this is a tricky bit, we're going to disconnect the image from the mask. See this little paper clip? That keeps them both sort of tied together. If I click on the paperclip, they're now separate. And now if I click on the image, yeah, and click the move tool, I can click and drag the sky, but see how the mask stays wrapped around my subject. So I can come up to, you should have little clouds on the horizon. That's one of the biggest mistakes photographers will make when trying this technique because you think, oh yeah, let's drop a 200 mil sky over a wide angle foreground. Yes, it looks fantastic. It looks dramatic. But if you don't have the perspective shift of small clouds on the horizon, it will just look like the earth, you know, the earth is flat and we're falling off the end of, ends of the earth there. Okay. So we need that kind of perspective shift. Those little clouds on the horizon are going to help us in this scenario. That's perfect. Okay, what do we need to do? Can you see, it's not too bad. There's a little bit of haloing. Can we see that? Little bit of haloing. The reason you get those fringes or halos is because the sky that I have just replaced is darker than the sky, of course, that was behind here. So this quite bright sky had a quite bright fringe. This one now has quite a dark fringe. The way that I generally will get, there's a couple of ways to get around this. I could just brighten up the sky and that would match in much, much better maybe, but I don't want to brighten up the sky. So what I'm going to do, click on the background layer, command or control J to duplicate. Yeah. And then move over to the tool menu and I want the burn tool. And we're going to select highlights. And 22% might be good. Let's see. Let's zoom in a little. Just here. You probably can't see a lot happening, but see that halo? It's gone. Down this side, a little bit of fringe. Gone. Funky looking tree branch. Let's 
taking a few more clicks to get that tree to look a bit more like a silhouette without that bright fringe. You know, that looks really, really good. I'll tell you what looks a bit odd, doesn't it? The water currently being that orangish, greenish colour. And yeah, we might bring the sky back into that colour later. I think we're going to have to, or neutralise the water back. The water should be reflecting roughly whatever the sky colour is. We've got a funky horizon here too, do we? We do. Let's just straighten that up before... Um, how many of you at home were screaming at me to straighten the horizon up? There we go. All right. All right, all right. Okay. Looking good. I'm not exactly sure what color combination we're going to go with yet, but let's now, which sky should we drop in? That really big intimidating cloud? Nah, let's go with that one. This is just a gnarly storm, isn't it? So let's go with this one. Command or Control A, Command or Control C. I lost my other background image before. There it is under there. Anyway, we're over here now. Click on the top layer, Command or Control V. All right, and we might even command or control T. Just make that image a little bit bigger. Yeah, something like that. Click OK. And we can do roughly the same. If we press command or control and click on this layer mask here, I can then add a layer mask to this most recent layer and we get something like that. And you can see actually that fringing needs to be a bit darker even again now because this image behind is much, much darker than the previous sky that we dropped in. In fact, we may not need much of that background sky at all, to be honest. We probably don't need a lot of it. Anyway, let's keep trucking along here. Let's unclick the layer relationship between the image again. Click on the image icon. Grab the Move tool. Where do we want this to sit? And if I press Command or Control T for free transform and move outside the boundaries, I have a little rotator, rotation icon. I'll just rotate that. And obviously I don't want to see... Well, that might be where the clouds on the base come in. They can paint over this section. Let's see if that works. Click OK. Let's run with that. This is, Photoshop's all an experiment. You know, it's like a, a game a, a, of problem solving to try and get to where we want to go. I never really know. But as you get more tools and more skills, um, you know, you have more options to try and get where you need to go. Now, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up the sky layer here, the sky mask, because it's such a beautiful sky mask. So I'm going to place this layer into a group. Command or Control G for group. You can see, see that is now in its own group. The reason I can do that is I now click a mask and I have a brand new mask that I can play with. It's like masking on top of a mask. So my other mask is under inside the group protected, but now I can use my brush and we can paint out, oh, the black brush we want. We can paint out this section of land here hmm hmm is it working it's looking a bit funky isn't it it's looking a bit funky all right let's see if we can't get this to work it's it's sort of there but sort of not um, now, I want that light just flicking under the clouds. I definitely want that. Yeah, that's better. Okay, now I need a smaller brush, X, and just come along here and make sure that land is gone. These trees are a bit of a pain, aren't they? That's not too bad. What I'm going to do is click down on this background layer and I'm going to add a hue saturation layer and try and match this blue to that yellowish color there. Let's see if we can do that. 
There's a couple of ways that we can try and attack this hue saturation layer and maybe playing with the hue is my new, new, or in actual fact, what I want to do is press the clipping icon, okay, because that was affecting the foreground and the sky. Now it will only affect the layer that I want it to affect. Look at that. That's... Yeah, okay, yeah, that worked, winning, okay, and even the even the, the horizon and the colors in the foreground now are looking pretty good. I think, um, I think my cloud could maybe, let's, let's do something similar here, new saturation, clip it down, what if we change the hue of the cloud a little, just make it a little bit green, maybe take a little bit of color out. All right, all right, we're, we're going okay. Come back to this layer, let's burn back. Let's burn back, so B for burn, no it's not B for burn, it's O isn't it? It's this one here, burn tool, yep. And I'll switch to mid-tones in fact. This side will be the shadow side anyway, so that's good. This side we're going to explode with some light, hopefully. So they should disappear in any case. Okay, looking good. I'm going to crop that now. Just tidy that up a little bit. Okay. Let's let's now work on. So basically what we had was all of this is kind of putting the new raw file together. That's what we started with. Now we've added all those base layers. We've got a good starting point. Now it's time to let me just crop again and just there was a little annoying bit down that bottom left. Now it's time to start processing. I'm not going to worry about the dust spots and this, that and the other in this particular image, but it's now time to process. So what I'm going to do, if I click on my bottom layer here, hold shift down, click on the top one, I can highlight them all, press command or control G for group, and I can just double click here. This can be called background. You know, that's just like a normal background layer. Now let's, let's work on processing. So I want to really lift and highlight the subject with a spray of light coming from here across this face. Some shadow down that side. Okay, let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can do that. Um, now to do that, let's go with, let's brighten up a little bit first, curves layer. Command or control I, B for brush, white brush. And we're just going to Paint a bit of light there, a bit of light there. Yep, that's pretty good. Okay, what I want to do is I want to add a splash of that pure golden sunlight across this edge that's facing the light. Let's see if we can do that. Solid color, choose an orange, yellow, somewhere there, click OK. Change to color dodge. Woo! It's pretty hectic, isn't it? You can see what we're trying to do, and I think this will work. What I am going to do, open up this group. I'm going to copy the layer mask, command or control, I mean command or control and click, right? And then come back up here, and if I press shift delete or shift backspace, I can fill the mask or fill the selection with black, which gives me that kind of effect which is great. Okay, removed most of that from the sky. And now, Command or Control D to remove that, I can 
Let's add that to a group. This is a little bit complex and you would understand this when you get to the final advanced course at easywayphotography.com, the way we're interacting with masks here to try and make it easier, but it is a little bit complex, I understand that. I'm now going to add this into a group, Command or Control G, add a layer mask and invert the group. Now essentially what I've done, the first mask restricted the sky, so we're not going to get any of that effect through the sky. Now the second mask restricts everything, which will now allow me to paint very accurate, accurately down the right hand edge here with any luck. Brush, white, let's see. Look at that, that's exactly what I wanted. A little bit there, oh, not on the back. A little bit there, a little bit there. Yeah, looking good, looking good. I probably could darken that tree down a little bit. Okay, let's do a shadow layer for the other side. It's kind of like dodging and burning. We'll put light on one side, shadow on the other, and it will give the subject a huge amount of dimension, which is something that I'm always trying to achieve. Oops, what have we done? What have we done? Let's move that out of the group. Okay. Darkening down. We've darkened down the whole image. Look at the drama we're getting when we darken down. You know? Okay, looking good. But we don't want all that drama just yet. Once again, where are we? I'm going to click and hold on one of these sky masks. And once again, shift delete, fill with black. That removes it from the sky. Once again, command or control G into a group. Add another layer mask on top. Oops, daisies. Deselect first, add another layer mask on top, and then Command or Control I to invert. This will allow me to paint like magic, paint inside that tight mask like magic. Watch this, just down this edge, bit of shadow. Okay, perfect. We might even dodge that up. If we come back to this layer, we could even Put a bit of light on the top there. A little bit of, let's, we could even put a little bit of light there. There's enough light there already, I think. Yeah, that's looking good. That looks good. X, there's a little bit too much just there. Okay, we are cooking. All right, I want to add a little bit more of an explosion of light and maybe some sea mist into the background right around the horizon here, which will add to the depth and dimension as well. Let's tidy up here, close a few of these down. Okay, the way we're going to do that, we're going to go for an explosion of light there on the horizon again, solid color, something like that. Click OK, once again, normal to color dodge. Too much, I agree. Double click back in on the colored icon. Yep, looks good. Click on the mask, command or control I to invert, hide that away, grab our B for brush, white brush, and just we're just going to illuminate that a little bit. And that. Perfect. A little bit there. Alright, that looks good. Let's add some pop and wow factor and drama into the clouds themselves. Curves layer. Grab the little hand. This is called split curve contrast. You'll find it in a video about three days back called something, my two favorite techniques to make your photos pop. We're going to click on a dark section of the clouds and a light section of the clouds. And we get two points. See how closely tied together they are. That means the tones are very, very tight. When we pull them apart, we should get this incredible separation and depth of detail. We are, but we're also getting some funky colors. So if we change the blend mode from normal to luminosity, it should help this a little. Whoop. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Forget about the outside. I'm looking for this funkiness in the middle, that grungy texture. Let's see.
Along with that opacity, we can put a bit there, maybe a bit there, a bit there. All right, looking good. Let's darken down the outsides, draw the attention right into the middle. We might pull down from here, pull down from here. Well, no, I didn't like that. If you don't like it, then let's go real dark. Command or control I to invert. Generally, I wouldn't go that dark. Many of the my students will be wondering why, but in this case, I think we can get away with it, maybe. Mm, maybe not. See how hard it is to paint in when I go really aggressively? Super difficult to paint in. Let me just back that off. That's better. Okay, curves, command or control I, that's really, I want that to be quite dark, that corner. We can also make that quite dark there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't half tell that I like going too far, right? Like way over the top, but it's fun. In the past, people would give me a hard time for that, but I've kind of gotten over listening to what other people think. In fact, I don't really post on social media anymore, so that much, um, because I just like doing my own thing, I guess. Let's just... The colors are a bit funky. Um, let's just desaturate them a little bit. New saturation. We'll pull that sky back. Let's bump that opacity back up. See if we can get a little bit more pop out of those central clouds, maybe. Photoshop slowing down. Keep chugging, Photoshop. Oh, come on. Grab the hand. I won't worry about two points. We'll just put them like this. So you see we managed, we're managing to get a little bit more light and pop out of that, those clouds. Where is... I don't like that dark shadow. I'm wondering where it's coming from. It's a bit that one. That's better. It's a bit that one. Ah, oh, that's nicer. That's probably, did I already remove it from that one? Probably a bit that one too. All right, I think we're getting pretty close. Look, it's nothing like the other one, I'll agree. There's a little bit too much green in the middle. Let me just fix that up again. A little bit too much green, and we'll do a color wash over the top to tie everything together too. Click on the hand. What is it? It's cyans. Let's pull the cyans back. Let's do a bit of a color wash. I think I want to do a photo filter, maybe in a cold color first. I don't know. Yeah, nah. 
little bit of that. Let's not drop the opacity. Yeah, okay. And then we'll do a solid color in soft light over the top in maybe a, a warm orange. Try and tie it all together. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Too dark. Okay, that's about where it is. To be honest, it's not my best edit. Let's go back and look at the finished one. Yeah, look at the finish and refinement. But that comes, this would be like the first draft. You know, that's the first draft. We've got a bit of a concept going on. Then I go away, have a cup of tea, come back, play with the colors, play with the light. What I would do is add, you know, we can kind of add that dusty sort of nostalgic feeling by pulling the black point up like this. You know, that could help as well. We could also maybe add, like we did yesterday, we can add that solid color, you know, a charcoal-y solid color layer in to sort of do the same thing, give it that sort of dusty, dusty feeling like that. Command or Control I, B for brush. And we could give it that around the edges, just a little bit. Take a little bit of the contrast away. Yeah, that's sort of getting closer now. The other image had a bit of an overall green tinge to it as well, didn't it? So we could even we could even do something like what would we do? Let's try photo filter with like a green. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's just about tweaking and playing. You know, we could use that photo filter, but then use our black brush and just bring through some of the warmth in the center here. Okay. Yeah. Well, just those couple of little layers really, really helped get us much, much closer. As Photoshop struggles to keep up this morning. Hopefully the stream's been coming through pretty well. Um, Oh, my good mate, Ricardo de Cuna. How you doing, mate? Uh, I can't wait to see what you've popped in the chat there. Okay, so there was the other one. A little bit extra pop in the center. Lots of exploding light. Yes, I agree. It's not exactly the same. It's getting pretty close, though. The general concept is there. It needs a little bit more refinement, which would happen over the next coming couple of weeks. Let me grab the phone, see if there's any questions, and we'll wrap this up for today. Did we break the record? I'm a bit I'm a bit obsessed with the record. 54 concurrently. I'll let you know tomorrow. Actually, I'm not back tomorrow. We're having the weekend off. I'll be back on Monday and we're going to look at things we can do to maybe generate some income. Maybe Monday, maybe Tuesday. Oh I mean, golly gosh, we've got so many comments. Thank you. So many comments. If you enjoyed, once again, hit the like button. If you don't want to miss an episode, hit the subscribe and get notifications. Tell your friends, all that kind of stuff. Any questions? Love to see how you put that together. I think that might be in reference to the big smashing storm swell. We'll have a look at that in the future. A composite and a fantastic end result. Thank you. Like it more than the seven image composite, I do too, to be honest. I like both this one and the Smashing Storm Swell better than the other one, the, the big Icelandic one with the mountains, etc., etc. That was an exercise in, in, you know, growing my skills, I suppose, more than anything. Loud and clear, great to hear. All good, all good. I had a blurry picture, but closed it and opened again, and it worked, and it's good. So I want to have a go of this. Sue Ellen. Hey, Sue Ellen. Good to have you here again. 50 says 54 watching. So we got real close. If we didn't break it, I'll let you know on Monday. Cheryl says, gives me a fantastic feeling of being in a fantasy image. Good to see others have train wrecks too. To be honest, I thought this was going to be a train wreck about five minutes ago. And I was just going to say, make up some excuse. But um, those last couple of layers saved me. Mike says, I'm in the zone. I don't know about that, Mike. I'm not sure I was in the zone. I was sort of 
struggling a bit. It's fun to watch. Okay, great. Ricardo, an absolutely stunning piece and demonstrated with so much poise as always. You're constantly... Oh, Rick, you're making me blush. Am I going red? Ricardo is one of the most um, beautiful human beings that this world has. Um, does incredible volunteer work and, and whatnot. Thank you for making your thinking process decision making visible. My pleasure, absolutely. Eye opener. Great work. It doesn't look like we had too many questions there. We'll do a Q&A next week anyway, a dedicated Q&A where we can, you can email me a bunch of questions or we can do live chat Q&A. But for the time being, keep in mind, if you're interested, I'm going to run through ways of generating or strengthening your business or even transitioning from whatever you're doing now to maybe making a little bit of money. Um, and the skill, you don't really need a high level of skill of photography initially. You can work up to that. I'm going to give you some options, some homework, some things to do, some things to work on that you know can keep a positive mindset and really keep us moving forward in these uncertain, tough times. For today, thanks so much for watching along. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Stay safe. Stay well. Love to your family. Have a great weekend. See you Monday. Bye for now.